and okay. it'll, it, you know, okay. red, so red it's, means it's on. A, it's an on yeah. off.
gentlemen all set? The subcommittee will come to order. Welcome to the Ways and Means Committee, joint hearing on oversight and Social Security subcommittees on examining the Social Security Administration's representative payee pro program who provides help. During our last hearing on this topic, we examined how Social Security Administration determines when someone needs a representative payee. Today, we are examining how the SSA oversees these payees, why the SSA has made some recent efforts to improve how it monitors more than six and a half million payees in the program. I believe that there is still significant room for improvement. I'm a big fan of continuous improvement. Historically, SSA has relied on annual accounting forms and conducted limited on-site reviews. In 2004, Congress strengthened SSA's monitoring effort by requiring additional mandatory on-site reviews for some payees. In addition, the SSA used a predictive model to identify high-risk payees for discretionary reviews. SSA recently selected a new contractor to, to annually conduct 5,000 discretionary on-site visits, almost doubled the, the number at 2,590 conducted last year. However, the number of oversight visits appears to be far too few to effectively oversee the millions of payees in this program or to assess the adequacy of the model. Other concerns have been raised by the agency's watchdogs, such as the SSA Inspector General, who continues to uncover example after example of payees taking advantage of the beneficiaries. One such example from my home state of Florida, Hillsborough County Achievement and Resource Center, HARC, a nonprofit serving the greater Tampa Bay area, was established to assist uh, Florida residents with development disabilities. Hark served as a representative payee for Social Security beneficiaries who needed help, manage their, help manage their finances. However, between 2001 and 2011, Hark employees diverted over $600 million in Social Security benefits, using them for their own personal gain. Hark employees also annually filed fraudulent accounting re uh, reports with the SSA to conceal their action. A victim's relative noted to our local NBC news station that if it hadn't been for their reporting, WFLA reporting, and also their effort in terms of the behalf of the U.S. attorney, probably nothing would have been uh, taken place. And while this example is particularly concerning because it occurred in my local community, similar stories exist across the country. Stories, stories such as this raise serious questions about where the SSA for the, for the past decade was in terms of fraud that's been occurring. Unless the SSA improves its program monitoring, I worry that these problems will only worsen as the population ages and numbers of individuals who need payee increases. Nevertheless, I'm encouraged by some of the progress being made through state programs. We have a number of witnesses here today to speak to the unique and innovative approaches that states are taking in areas of guardian, guardianship, much of which may be applicable to the representative payee program. I also look forward to hearing from the SSA about ways in which Congress can assist you in better administrating and overseeing these programs. I again want to thank the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to your testimonies on this important topic. And now I yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Lewis from Georgia, for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I would also like to thank all the witnesses for being here today. This morning, we will study the representative pay program. As you know, the Social Security Administration can appoint a person or organization to manage the benefits for some beneficiaries. These representatives must ensure that those with serious mental and physical disability receive good, honest, quality care. The rep payee is expected to do all they can to protect the most vulnerable among us. SSA must carefully select and regularly monitor payees. In the past, Social Security Administration worked with each state's protection and advocacy agent, known as PNAs, to perform this oversight. They knew what they were doing, but most rep payees do a good 
and necessary job, some do not. In my home state of Georgia, the P&A reviews work on behalf of the SSA, discover a harbor case or the neglect and abuse of multiple persons with disabilities. They live in terrible housing run by an unlicensed board and care operator. The building smells of rotten seafood and the living condition were horrible. The local PNA immediately assigned the alarm to the SSA to order to adult protective service and to the agency that regulate health care facility. The PNA took no chances. They waste no time. Many of us are concerned that the Social Security Administration selected a contractor which does not appear to have the critical skills. Perhaps this was due to the extreme budget situation facing the agency. Perhaps SSA thought that they could cut corners and save money with this contract. Respecting the dignity and the worth of every human being is not about a price tag. It is about doing what is right, what is fair, and what is just. Mr. Chairman, we cannot strengthen this program by starving Social Security. You simply cannot squeeze blood from a turner. Congress must give the hard working staff the support and resources they need to protect and serve the most vulnerable among us. All of us agree that those who prey upon our brothers and sisters must be caught. They must be dealt with. They must be held accountable. I know that each and every one of us will be paying close attention to this situation. On this issue, there's no room for error. There's no space for failure. There's no time to delay. We're here today because we have a moral responsibility and an obligation to leave no stones unturned on this issue. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to the testimony. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I now yield to the distinguished chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee, Mr. Johnson from Texas, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, and welcome to the second of two joint Social Security and Oversight hearings on Social Security's representative pay program. While the first hearing focused on how Social Security decides who needs help managing their benefits, today's hearing is going to focus on how Social Security selects and oversees those who provide the help. Today, there are about 6.5 million representative payees managing benefits for about 8 million Social Security beneficiaries and Supplemental Security Income recipients. The number of representative pays is expected to increase as the population ages and more people need help managing their Social Security benefits. According to a 2015 study from Social Security, the number of adults who need a representative pay will increase by more than 20 percent over the next two decades. Furthermore, the number of people receiving help from someone other than a family member will increase by more than a quarter. Who Social Security selects as a representative pay is a really important decision since it is their job to make sure that benefits are used for the individual's basic needs. Folks who need a representative pay deserve to know that the person serving as their pay is up to the job. And while Social Security has some rules to place in place to help, those rules aren't always followed. Common sense would say that someone who relies on a representative pay themselves shouldn't, shouldn't be the representative pay for someone else. And you believe that's happening. How can you manage someone else's benefits when you can't manage your own? Yet in 2016, the IG found that Social Security had people serving as representative pays, even though Social Security knew these folks had representative pays of their own. 
The IG has even found people serving as a representative payee that Social Security has no record of selecting. Worse, for nearly 20 years, the IG has repeatedly found that Social Security continued to pay payees they knew were dead. And the list goes on. This is simply unacceptable. You can have all the rules in place that say all the right things, but if the rules aren't being followed, what good are they? There has to be a better way. At our first hearing in this series, Social Security said that the greatest challenge they face is monitoring representative pay behavior. Although Social Security has increased its monitoring of payees, the IG and others continue to find cases of representative payee fraud. Chairman Buchanan provided an example of why it's so important that Social Security get this right. And, as we'll hear today, some states, like Texas, are taking steps to get a better handle on managing their guardianship programs. While representative payees and guardianships are not the same, there are things we can learn from what our states are doing. As I said at the previous hearing, the Congress has not made changes to the representative pay program since 2004, and now it's time to take a fresh look. I look forward to working with Social Security, stakeholders, and all my colleagues to make sure this very important program is working like it ought to. The American people deserve no less. I thank our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I now yield to the ranking member, Larson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I want to also uh, thank both of you for holding this uh, hearing. And I want to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Lewis and uh, join with our other colleagues in welcoming our panelists. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we, uh, of course, something I think all of you know that uh, 10,000 people a day uh, turn 65 years of age. And so I think it's constructive that our colleagues here uh, across the board, Democrat and Republican, are concerned especially about preserving a program that Dwight David Eisenhower brought into existence to make sure that we were taking care of those amongst us who have uh, disabilities. That only continues to grow. Unfortunately, in these same difficult times, the uh, budget for uh, Social Security uh, continues uh, to remain stagnant. Uh, and while we applaud the efforts, and we should do everything possible to rout out any kind of fraud and abuse in any program, and they should face the most severe penalties because they're detracting from the American citizens who need it the most. But we also have to make sure that we're strategic in the way that we handle this and how we function. I don't think it's strategic to take money out of an existing budget to focus on fraud and abuse and then not leave the very agencies that are dealing with disability and Social Security with fewer dollars. In fact, uh, consider that 10 million new beneficiaries have entered the system since 2010 and that Social Security's operating budget has fallen by 10% in the same period. With baby boomers coming in, as I indicated, at 10,000 a day, you would think that in order to address this issue, this is not the time to be cutting the budget. Uh, this is a time that we should be expanding in these areas. And so we're together in terms of wanting to route out the fraud and abuse and waste, and one of the things that we're concerned about, though, especially with the long waiting periods and lines also, is the various mechanisms that you're bringing. We're particularly concerned on this committee, and we'll, uh, part of my questioning will focus on this area as well, the hiring of the Information Systems and Network Corporation, uh, ISN, and their contract calls for them to do 1,300 reviews by this August. They've done 11 to date. Uh, so we'd like to get to answers with respect uh, to that. And we're also uh, concerned in general, and I'd like to submit for the record, if I might, Mr. Chairman, this LA 
Times article that Trump budget director revives a fact-free conservative attack on disability recipients because I think it's very pertinent uh, to the enormous stress that the agency is under in its ability to provide, obviously, the most successful governmental program in the history of the nation uh, and to put it under further stress or to discount what people on disabilities are going through and to make allegations that are fact-free are something that need to be corrected for the record, and I'll be asking uh, our various panelists about that as well. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Without objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Today's witness panel includes five experts. Ms. La Canfor, uh, Acting Deputy Commissioner, Office of Retirement and Disability Policy for the Social Security Administration. Ms. Stone, Acting Inspector General, Social Security Administration. Mr. Ford, Senior Executive Officer, Public Policy, the ARC, who is testifying on behalf of Consortium for Citizens with Disability Social Security Task Force. Ms. Eker, uh, Principal Court Research Consultant, National Center for State Courts. Mr. Slayton, Administrative Director, Texas Office of Court Administration. This, the subcommittee have received your written statements and they will all be added to the formal hearing. You both, all of you had five minutes to deliver your oral remarks. And let us, if we can start with you, Mrs. Canfora. Chairman Johnson, Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Larson, Ranking Member Lewis, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for inviting me to discuss how the Social Security Administration monitors its representative payee program and to describe our recent accomplishments. I'm Mariana Lacanfora, Acting Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy. We appoint representative payees under our Social Security and Supplemental Security Income programs for minor children and for adults who are incapable of managing monthly benefits. We currently have around 5.7 million payees who assist about 8 million beneficiaries with their payments. Today I'd like to describe our oversight of these payees. First, I should note that being a payee requires a significant commitment of time and attention with few rewards beyond the satisfaction of helping someone in need. Yet millions of Americans rise to this challenge every day. Our reviews show that representative payees generally manage beneficiary funds appropriately. Even so, we must strive to protect our most vulnerable beneficiaries. By law, we conduct reviews for all fee-for-service payees, organizational payees who serve more than 50 beneficiaries, and individuals serving 15 or more beneficiaries, as well as state mental institutions. We also conduct additional site reviews of organizational and individual payees beyond those that are required in the Social Security Act. We select these payees for review using a misuse predictive model that's based on common characteristics in known misuse cases. Recently, we redesigned and strengthened our on-site review program, and we're phasing in these changes over a several year period. The most notable improvements are as follows. First, we will use a skilled contractor to conduct all reviews. Most on-site reviews were previously conducted by our field office employees, a task that they were not always prepared to handle. The contractor will also handle follow-up activities, such as ensuring corrective action by the payee on such issues as record keeping or titling of bank accounts. This will allow our field office employees to focus on programmatic issues, such as changing the payee when needed. Two, we're targeting more high-risk payees, including those that live in a different state from the beneficiary. Three, we're conducting face-to-face -face beneficiary interviews at the place of residence for the first time. These reviews were largely done by phone in the past. Fourth, we plan to more than double the number of annual on-site reviews over several years, budget permitting. Our goal is to conduct 5,000 reviews annually. We believe that increasing the number of reviews is important to the integrity of this program. And lastly, we've created a new centralized monitoring team to ensure consistent application of our policies and procedures. 
We're also developing a new database to track all cases, detect trends, and quickly identify misuse. While on-site reviews are the cornerstone of our oversight program, I'd like to mention just a few other improvements that we've made to the RepPayE program. In February of 2014, we implemented a criminal bar policy, which prevents applicants who have committed serious crimes from serving as payee. In 2015, we enhanced our business process with the Department of Veterans Affairs to share information that helps us with our misuse investigations. In addition, we launched our electronic representative payee system in April of 2016. The new system ensures consistent application of policies and procedures and better access to data that will help us improve our predictive model. And earlier this year, we strengthened our capability determination policy based on our internal quality reviews and recommendations from the National Academies of Medicine. Lastly, we've commissioned research through our Retirement Research Consortium grant program to explore outcomes for individuals served by representative payees, focusing on those with dementia. To learn more about their experience with the Rep Payee program and where we might make improvements. Thank you for the opportunity to describe the ways in which we continue to strengthen the Payee program. We look forward to our ongoing collaboration with your committee. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Stone, you're next up. Thank you, Chairman Buchanan, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Lewis, Ranking Member Larson. Good morning to you and the subcommittee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and to continue our conversation about SSA's representative payee program. On an annual basis, about six million payees manage $70 billion in benefits for about 8 million beneficiaries. Most payees are the beneficiary's family members, and SSA maintains that the vast majority of payees properly manage beneficiary funds. However, with limited in-person monitoring of payees, the threat of misuse persists. We investigate cases of individual and organizational payee fraud as well as conduct audits and make recommendations to improve payee selection and monitoring. To investigate questionable payees, we rely on allegations from SSA, citizens, public and private organizations, and other sources. We carefully review every allegation to, uh, to determine the appropriate actions to take. In one case, based on an allegation from SSA, we investigated a Texas man who served as the payee for a disabled friend. The man had a criminal history, but SSA selected him to serve as the payee because the beneficiary did not have family members or other friends willing to serve. Soon after, the man received a $64,000 retroactive payment intended for the beneficiary. However, he used some of those funds to buy himself a truck and a motorcycle. As a result of our investigation, the man pled guilty to theft of government funds, a judge sentenced him to prison, and ordered him to repay $29,000 to Social Security. In another case, based on allegations made to SSA, we investigated the owner of an organizational payee in Minnesota. This payee served more than 300 people. <coughs> Beneficiaries complained that they could not contact the organization for assistance they could not obtain funds for their personal needs, and their bills were not being paid. The owner, it turns out, used the beneficiary's funds to pay for personal and business expenses. Because of our investigation, the owner pled guilty to representative payee fraud. A judge sentenced him to prison and ordered him to repay $485,000 to SSA. On the audit side, we've conducted several reviews of SSA's actions as it relates to payee misuse. When, we, when SSA identified misuse, we found some exceptions in that the agency did not always reissue benefits to beneficiaries in a timely manner, did not obtain restitution from payees, did not explain why payees that had misused benefits continued to serve as payees, and in some instances, they did not refer all the allegations over to the OIG. We believe SSA should comply with its policies and procedures for resolving P 
payee misuse issues. Our audit work has identified several data anomalies in SSA systems, some of which have been referred to today. We found instances in which beneficiaries with payees actually serve as payees for others. This is against SSA policy. We've also identified millions of dollars of payments provided to deceased payees, payees without social security numbers in SSA systems, and payees identified in SSA systems as either terminated or not selected. To improve program integrity and payment accuracy, SSA should consider developing systems enhancements that one, alert employees to these discrepancies or anomalies, and secondly, will require employees to resolve these issues before continuing to process payee actions. To conclude, the population of beneficiaries with payees includes some of our most vulnerable citizens. SSA has many service responsibilities, but it must prioritize careful administration and monitoring of the payee program. We will continue to work with SSA and your subcommittees to address, to address these challenges. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Ford. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Chairman Buchanan and Johnson, Ranking Members Lewis and Larson, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the CCD Social Security Task Force. We appreciate your ongoing oversight of the representative payee program. For beneficiaries, payees, or monitoring, there is no one-size-fits-all. Roughly 80% of non-elderly adults with payees have a mental impairment, including intellectual disability, autism, or a mental illness. Because payees handle a critical source of income for vulnerable Americans, I will focus on several concerns. Over the decades, the CCD Task Force has considered whether there should be more formal procedures in the program to strengthen protections for the beneficiary. At the end, we felt that flexibility in determining need and appointment of payees is beneficial and that the current framework is largely appropriate. The need for support can change over time. Often older people see their fin financial skills diminishing over time, while some younger people may be gaining those skills over time, starting out with a payee and developing financial abilities until they no longer need one. We encourage Congress to continue to balance flexibility and individualization with protections and oversight, and to avoid turning the payee program into a process like guardianship that is more rigid or formal and restrictive, further limiting individual rights. The vast majority of payees perform their duties well under difficult circumstances. However, a small percentage have misused benefits and violated fiduciary duties. Some have even abused and neglected beneficiaries. As you heard earlier, a recent case in Georgia illustrates the importance of in-depth, on-site monitoring. Ten beneficiaries were found living in social isolation and extreme poverty in a dilapidated, dirty personal care home run by the rep payee. A gate across the kitchen was locked at night to keep residents out. Women living on the second floor had access to first floor common areas, including the kitchen, only through an outside staircase. The protection and advocacy system was reviewing the use of beneficiary funds, observed the deplorable conditions, and contacted adult protective services for that home, as well as other residences on the same property run by the same payee. Monitoring the rep payee program must be robust and vigorous, particularly for people who are nonverbal or face other barriers to advocating for themselves. A monitoring agency must have extensive expertise to ensure that reviews will detect problems and uncover hidden abuse. The monitors must have on-the-ground presence in all 50 states and familiarity with a range of local service providers and government agencies. They must have experience with the full range of settings where beneficiaries receive housing, treatment, services, supports, and other assistance, and across persons with different types of disabilities. They must have experience monitoring community facilities and representative payees and identifying fraud and abuse. They must be able to integrate across, the dis across disability focus and understanding of disability rights, not limited to representative payee financial responsibilities, and have partnerships with national and state coalitions, including self-advocacy groups. 
Organizational payees or those who serve large numbers of individuals are in a unique role of trust, handling government benefits for people who can be quite vulnerable. In some cases, they are also creditors who operate the place where a person lives, providing basic services and supports, and have significant influences, influence over many aspects of a person's life. Creditors especially require careful consideration before being appointed and ongoing monitoring because the role as payee may conflict with the role as creditor. Adequate monitoring requires, among other things, home visits for all beneficiaries selected for review and interviews of a sample of beneficiaries to confirm information provided by the payee and to assess whether the payee is meeting the individual's needs. Monitors must be prepared for and expected to take appropriate action to protect vulnerable people whom they have learned are in need of additional assistance. Given the necessary and appropriate scope of the monitoring, we believe that Congress should designate one or more statutorily authorized government entities to conduct this type of robust monitoring of large payees and additional wildcard monitoring. Finally, the CCD Task Force has been alarmed by the impact of net reductions in SSA's operating budget since FY 2010 on SSA's ability to adequately serve beneficiaries and the public. Congress must ensure that any new initiatives to enhance the representative payee program are adequately funded and staffed so as not to further erode other agency services. I appreciate this opportunity to testify and, and would, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eker. Uh, we'll hear your testimony next. Good morning, Chairs Buchanan and Chair Johnson, Ranking Members Lewis and Larson and members of the subcommittees. Thank you for inviting me here to discuss the intersection of conservatorships and the Social Security Representative Payment Program. My name is Brenda Eckert, and I'm the Principal Court Research Consultant and Director of the Center for Elders in the Courts at the National Center for State Courts. The National Center is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Williamsburg, Virginia, whose mission is to improve the administration of justice through leadership and service to state courts and courts around the world. My areas of expertise include aging issues, elder abuse and exploitation, and adult guardianships and conservatorships. Because terminology varies from state to state, we use generalized terms. Guardianships refer to those cases in which the court has appointed an individual to handle the medical and well-being issues of an incapacitated person, while conservatorships refer to those cases in which an individual has been appointed by the court to manage the finances of another person. The following remarks focus on conservatorships, which are the most pertinent to the Social Security Representative Payment Program. We estimate that there are approximately 1.3 million active adult guardianship or conservatorship cases, and that courts oversee at least $50 billion of assets under adult conservatorships nationally. My written testimony addresses issues that can dramatically improve e efficiencies and oversight of conservatorships, including the modernization of processes and professional auditing, the use of differentiated case management strategies to prevent and address exploitation, the development of interactive online training programs to provide basic education for non-professional guardians and conservators, and improvements in information sharing between state courts and the Social Security Administration. For this hearing, I will focus on this last item, information sharing. Data on the overlap between conservatorships and the Social Security Representative Payment Program do not exist, but given the fact that persons under an adult conservatorship are elderly or disabled, a sizable proportion of conservators are likely to be representative payees. The Social Security Administration, under the Code of Federal Re Regulations, Section 401.180D states that SSA will not honor state court orders as a basis for disclosure. Consequently, one of the biggest complaints we hear from judges is that SSA does not recognize an official state court order that removes a conservator for cause. In practice, this means that a conservator who misappropriates or steals funds from the protected person may continue to serve as his or her representative payee. The Social Security Administration may address the issue through its own internal investigation, but their policy deems the official state court order to have no standing. In 2014, the National Center conducted a survey of state court judges and staff to address collaboration between state courts and the Social Security Administration. 
when asked to provide recommendations for improving coordination, a number of judicial respondents suggested that SSA local or regional offices designate staff to act as a liaison to state courts. But such designated contacts, even if appointed, do not resolve the limitations placed on SSA by the Federal Privacy Act of 1974, which limits the sharing of information about beneficiaries and representative payees with state courts. The Privacy Act works to the detriment of protected persons. For example, if SSA finds that a representative payee has misappropriated funds and is also a conservator, they are forbidden from sharing such information with the court. Despite these challenges, the level of collaboration between state courts and SSA has improved substantially, primarily as an outcome of the creation of working interdisciplinary networks of guardianship stakeholders, otherwise known as WINGS. WINGS groups currently exist in 17 states and territories to advance guardianship reform, improve coordination, address abuse, and promote less restrictive alternatives. SSA has initiated a structured set of contacts with state WINGS groups by appointing a regional SSA WINGS representative for each of the participating states and has indicated willingness to adopt additional representatives to upcoming new state WINGS programs. In sum, state courts have increasingly embraced collaborative approaches that introduce multidisciplinary perspectives to specific problems such as conservatorships. Yet for state court judges who strive to protect all assets, including social security checks, the SSA's interpretation of federal privacy law and its refusal to honor state court off is, affects the court negatively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slayton. You pr may proceed with your testimony. Chairman Buchanan, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Lewis, and Ranking Member Larson, Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk about some of the work we're doing with adult guardianship and minor guardianship in Texas. My name is David Slayton and I work for the Judicial Branch in Texas. Uh, in our state, there are over 51,000 active guardianships and the number of active guardianships has increased by 37% in just the last five years. The value of the estates under guardianship in our state exceeds $5 billion. <clears throat> Texas law requires professional guardians in our state to be certified and continuously regulated by the state. A certified guardian is required to meet certain age, experience, and education requirements, along with passage of an examination and no disqualifying offenses on a criminal background check. The criminal background check continuously monitors the certified guardian and notifies the state if the guardian has an event appear on his or her criminal record. There is no, currently no registration or regulation of guardians who are licensed attorneys, family members, or friends. These individuals are appointed in the majority of cases in Texas. However, in 2015, the legislature enacted a requirement that judges must obtain a criminal background check prior to the appointment of family members and friends, and a bill pending in the legislature at this point in Texas would add some registry of all these individuals uh, to the registry. Seeing what he referred to as the, quote, silver tsunami approaching in Texas, where the population over age 65 will double in the next 20 years, Supreme Court Chief Justice Nathan Hecht established a wings group and called for the Texas Judicial Council, which has representation from the, the, the wings group has representation from the Social Security Administration to in, make several key recommendations, including ensuring that all appropriate alternatives to guardianship were explored. Those provisions were enacted in 2015. The new law requires applicants for guardianship, attorneys in the case, and judges certify that all alternatives to guardianship have been explored and that none are feasible. <clears throat> Texas became the first state in the nation to authorize an additional alternative to guardianship. <clears throat> supported decision-making agreements. A supported decision-making agreement is an agreement between an adult with a disability and another adult that enables the adult with a disability to make life decisions with the assistance of an adult supporter. This type of agreement has been used and promoted as an appropriate alternative for minors with developmental or other disabilities who are reaching the age of majority and other adults with disabilities. Since Texas's passage of this alternative, Delaware has also enacted a supported decision-making agreement law, and other states are considering it as well. In addition to these, the legislature provided funding to assist courts in adequately monitoring guardianship cases. Since 2015, the pilot project has reviewed over 13,600 guardianships in our state. The pilot project has made disturbing discoveries. For instance, the project reported that almost half of the cases were found to be non-compliant with statutory reporting requirements, including 48% of the cases which did not contain required annual accountings. 
The vast majority of the cases were out of compliance, that were out of compliance were cases where the guardian was a family member or friend. While the numbers tell a disturbing story, each specific case paints a more horrific picture. The project regularly found unauthorized withdrawals from accounts, unauthorized gifts to family members and friends, unsubstantiated and unauthorized expenses, and the lack of backup data to substantiate the accountings. Take Ms. Camacho, an elderly woman who is currently missing and whose estate has been drained by the guardian, or Ms. Thomas, who was sexually assaulted by her guardian's husband and remained under the guardian's control even after the husband went to prison, and for whom no well-being report of the person has been filed for the past two years. In my written testimony, I provided several other examples. When lack of compliance is found, we work with the court to get those cases back into compliance. Most have been resolved, some have not been responsive. While Social Security has been a partner to Texas as we've proceeded with reforms, concerns remain regarding the representative payee program. Most representative payees selected by the Social Security Administration are the same person appointed by the judge as the guardian for the ward. However, this is not always the case. When the judge considers the criminal background and appropriateness of an individual seeking to be a guardian, the judge may find that person to be inappropriate to serve as the guardian. When two separate individuals are appointed to manage the affairs of the guardian, difficulties may arise. In addition, since the Social Security Administration representative payee is not the subject to the judge's oversight the way the guardian is, the judge has little he or she can do to protect the ward from any abuse that might occur from the representative payee. Greater collaboration between SSA and the courts and guardianship proceedings would be beneficial. For instance, if a judge appoints an individual as a guardian and there's an existing representative payee, it'd be beneficial for the representative payee to be substituted with the guardian appointed for the by the judge, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your excellent testimony. We'll now proceed to the questions and answer session. In keeping with past precedent, I'll hold my question till the end. I now want to recognize the distinguished gentleman, Mr. Johnson, for any questions he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Lockenfora, after the Weston case, the Social Security Administration piloted a criminal policy that prohibited individuals who have committed certain crimes from serving as representative payees. This pilot is now nationwide. Can you give me some examples of the types of crimes that would keep someone from being selected as a pay? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. There are 12 crimes that are really very severe crimes, like first degree homicide, rape, uh, um, forgery, things like that, that are, that are basically indicators that the individual would not serve as a good payee, in which case we will bar them from being a payee. To this point, we've barred approximately 1,000 people from becoming representative payees as a result of that bar policy. How do you get that information? We do criminal background checks, and we have a contractor from whom we obtain the information. Is that nationwide or by state? Nationwide. Thank you. Those are serious crimes, however, the policy is only applied to new pays, and Social Security has never checked existing pays. Is that true? And if so, what's stopping you? So it's partially true. Part of the challenge that we have, as you know, is that the scope of the representative payee program is enormous. We've got six million people serving as payee, and in order to do a criminal background check, we have to actually get the consent of the individual to access their criminal background information. So you can imagine the task we would have going out and getting consent from six million payees. That said, every time we change a payee, we will do the criminal background check. And approximately 300,000 payee changes are done every year in addition to the new ones that we select. So while we're not doing a wholesale uh, check on the six million, we are getting to those folks little by little. How many in your estimation are sitting out there that are unchecked? It's hard to tell. I think if we're doing 300,000, that's an approximation each year, and we've been doing it for a few years, we, we're, we should be close to about a million now that we've done out of the six million. And that, that, that doesn't include the ones that have been newly selected, which are all checked. Thank you. Mr. Slayton, uh, Texas uses background checks to screen guardians. What types of crimes would keep someone from being a guardian? And do you screen everyone? So uh, we basically look at any sort of uh, theft, uh, any serious offense. Um, it's, there's a, a matrix of offenses, mostly the serious offenses, but anything that would also call into question the uh, integrity of the individual to appropriately manage funds for the, for the uh, protected person. 
Um, we do check, the, the law requires every new guardian to be uh, checked. And um, for individuals who are certified by the state, uh, it's continuously checked. So we require them to submit fingerprints, uh, which then allows there to be a continuous check. And if there is a hit on the criminal background check, it notifies the state where we can then take action uh, in those cases. Is Tech providing you facilities out there? Say that again, I'm sorry? Is the university providing you facilities out there? Uh, they are not, but it's a really great university. Uh, <laughs> they're not. They're, uh, the, the tech, you said Texas Tech? Yeah. Um, they are not. Uh, we, we operate in Austin. Oh, okay. The capital. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Texas uh, has made some changes to background checks for state guardians. One of those changes is to collect fingerprints to allow for ongoing monitoring. Why did you all think that was a necessary uh, step? Well, I think there's two main reasons. There's, there's basically two ways to get the criminal background check. There's a name check and a fingerprint check. Um, obviously, with name checks, uh, we can uh, oftentimes have names that are very similar, and so it's hard to be able to tell exactly if this is the individual we're looking at. And those are one-time checks. So we run it today. We see if the person has a criminal um, issue on their background today, but it doesn't provide any continuous monitoring. The fingerprints allow us to, of course, ensure that the person that we're monitoring is the right person we're looking at and it provides anytime something shows up on the record in the future we will immediately be notified that there's a criminal um, history issue on their background. Thank you. I appreciate that work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Lewis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sladen, it would be my uh, honor, I guess, uh, pleasure to be visiting Austin uh, uh, this weekend, if we get out of here, uh, I look forward to, we, you know, we may be here, left up to the guys on this side. <laughs> but I look forward to being in, being in Austin. Great. Uh, Ms. Ford, uh, it is clear that someone who would need a representative pay may also be very vulnerable uh, to abuse. We're talking about children, adults, with severe mental disabilities and seniors who are very frail. Representative payee review must personally assess each situation. Uh, can you talk more about what difficulties pay reviews can encounter when trying to determine if abuse is going on or taking place? Thank you. I, th I think it's important to be able to see a situation uh, on site, as I mentioned, and to talk to the individual and see the setting that they are in. Uh, I, it's not always possible to tell what's going on from just a paper review of where the money is going. You need to find out whether the individual is, is receiving um, their money, obviously and whether their needs are being met by the representative payee, their financial needs. But uh, in asking questions of them, you can determine some things if you're knowledgeable about disability and how a, an individual might react. You can find out certain things and how they react can tell you uh, whether you need to go further. Um, for instance, um, just it, it, does silence mean that everything is okay? Uh, does it mean that the person does not understand the question? Do you need to, to, um, to probe a little further? Is there a cognitive impairment here that means that um, more is needed to find out what's going on? Uh, is there a fear of the representative payee? Is there some undue influence going on? Um, are the conditions that they're living in, uh, as we discovered in Georgia, uh, really untenable? Um, th those kinds of things can only be seen not on paper, but on site and by talking to the person and to their and seeing the situation that they're in. For an example, if a beneficiary cannot communicate, what do you do? What steps do you take? Um, there, if a person is not able to communicate verbally, there are ways that people do actually communicate non-verbally. The way that they, they uh, handle themselves, the way that they um, uh, communicate um, with their facial expressions, their eyes, the, do they flinch when somebody comes near them, a certain person, do they um, reach out, um, they may have communication boards, they may have uh, ways of uh, 
communicating in that way. There may be family members who can help communicate or help uh, another individual understand their particular language, their, their vocal sounds. Uh, so it's, uh, it takes um, time, it takes being careful, but these people are particularly more vulnerable uh, to being ignored for one thing, um, and that's why it takes a little more time, and that's why it's more important to pay attention because uh, it's not gonna be as easy to find out what is going on if you don't take that time. Uh, I mean, just, uh, Mr. Forward, it sounds like a representative pay review uh, need to be a certain kind of person, a special person, to be sensitive, caring. Um, is it easy to find these type of people? I, I think that, uh, I, I don't know how easy it has been for SSA to find uh, all the rep payees that they need to find. I do think that in the monitoring system, it is going to take a, a particular type of monitoring to be able to detect that there are problems going on. I think it, it takes both. You've got to have the right kind of representative payee, whether that's an individual or an organization. You're gonna have to have the right people in that organization. And then when you go to find out how it's working, you need to have the right kind of people who can look at it and say, this is more than just whether the money is in the right place. This is, these are the right people doing the right thing, or these are people who, who don't care, they're just moving money around and they're letting this person's life just um, you know, go to nothing. Um, they're not really doing the right thing for this individual. So it, it, takes, uh, it takes the right people in both places. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lolowarski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lockenfor, I'm just trying to logistically get my mind around the process, so I'm just gonna ask you really short questions. Short answers would help me understand this just so I can get the process through here. So, Social Security requires most payees to submit an annual accounting form, correct? Correct. Can they do that in writing or is it online? Uh, either or. So what steps does SSA go through when it receives these forms in? And my question is this. So, there, what would trigger when these forms come in whether or not that they're gonna go for further review to a field supervisor? So if, what would trigger that? There's two main reasons that something would go to somebody in a field office to review. One is a non-responder, so somebody just doesn't send back the form, and we need to track down what's going on there. And then secondly, there's something anomalous on the form. The numbers don't add up, they write a lot of remarks that need to be reviewed by a human being, that sort of thing. So in going through that process, so if the, if the numbers look fine, if the numbers jive, and there's nothing that really flags anything, that moves through the system, correct? Correct. So, if there's a problem and a flag, does SSA require supporting documentation that backs up the amounts on the form, like receipts or anything like that, or logs, cash logs or anything? It's possible that we would do that. It depends on what the anomaly is. In some cases, it might actually trigger us to do an on-site in-person review. In other cases, it might be a simple you know, mathematical error on the part of the beneficiary that could be resolved with a conversation, or on the part of the payee, rather, sorry. So this is just a note. In the Social Security Administration's handbook, it says, quotes, if the total is less than 90% of the total acceptable amount and the payee cannot resolve the difference, the, the FO will conduct a face-to-face -face interview and complete an SSA, SSSA 624-F5. Put another way, if the payee's total is off by less than 10%, it really is okay. I think technically at the end of the day, that would be. We have to remember that a lot of these payees, in fact, the vast majority of them are, are custodial parents and spouses. And so they, you know, we, we encourage and hope that people keep books very carefully. But the reality is that people who are, you know, living uh, with day to day are not always right. doing that. So we, we give them a little bit of latitude. Right, I understand. The, the folks doing this are well-intentioned, they're volunteers, and, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. But technically, theoretically, a bad actor could submit an accounting form with made up amounts, no supporting documentation, but as long as their numbers are close, they really aren't flagged. They really could, a bad actor could maneuver through the system like that, correct? Through the accounting process? Correct. That is true. So I think it's interesting. Um, I have this article that just came out today in an Indiana paper. I just got it this morning. It's in the neighboring district of mine. It says, women sentenced for security, social security fraud 
And it says the woman reported, failed to report to SSA her children no longer lived with her while continuing to receive benefits. She was sentenced on Tuesday in federal court to serve 15 months in prison and pay back in restitution $71,410. $71, and so, you know, I guess my, my final question here is, you know, I made reference and read a 2007 report by the National Academy of Science. They recommended that the SSA, quote, redesign the annual accounting form to obtain the meaningful accounting data and, and payee characteristics that would facilitate evaluation of risk factors and payee performance. It would seem to me this would be a common sense kind of practice. And I guess my question is, how has the SSA addressed that recommendation, which was made 10 years ago? So the reality is we're already collecting that information at the point of initial application. Everything that was recommended in that particular report, uh, most of those recommendations we implemented, but that particular one was redundant of, with what we already do. When someone applies to be a payee, we ask them a whole variety of questions to make sure that they are in fact suitable to be a payee, and that's part of our capability determination process. If we collected the same information on the accounting form, it would be redundant. Would you think it would be, I guess in the future, are you moving to an online system from the individual scripted reports to an online system? Is SSA moving in the direction of online? We have an complete? online reporting system. I think the, one of the questions that we have, and it's one that we've been discussing with your staffs, is what's the right balance between the self-reporting that's done through the annual accounting process versus the on-site reviews? which are really more effective and where should we be putting our resources? Right now those accountings are required by law, which is why we do them, but you know, in light of these hearings, it may be time to think about what, what uh, options we have. I appreciate it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, John Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit uh, two uh, articles, one by NPR, a wake-up call to protect vulnerable workers from ab abuse, and the other Life deal for women who enslaved disabled adults in Taconi basement, for the record. That's fine. I think they're consistent with a number of the concerns that the committee is investigating and, and looking at. <clears throat> and um, one of the things I want to start with is, Ms. Lankamfora, you were talking about uh, earlier uh, that you're only going to be able to get to a million of the six and a half million, and that's provided things go, go well. What is the reason for that? Is it a lack of resources? Is it a lack of uh, ability? Is it just getting that permission that's required? Is it a problem with the courts, as Ms. Euchert apparently pointed out? What is, what is the problem there? So I think you're referring specifically to the criminal bar policy where we uh, check to see if a person is convicted of one of 12 serious crimes before we appoint them as payee. We do that now in all cases where someone's applying to be the payee or where we're making a change in the payee. But there are, of course, six and a half million pay or six million payees out there, and as Chairman Johnson pointed out, we haven't done a wholesale look at those six and what a half million. What would it million. take to do that? That's my we question. Would, we would have to, because we have to get the consent of each individual to check their. What kind of background, resources? We would have to contact six million people and get their authorization. You have the resources to do that. It would be cost prohibitive for us to do that. Okay, so you don't have the resources to do that. I just wanted to. Now, uh, Ms. Ford, in your uh, uh, testimony, one of the things that we're concerned about is, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, about the Information Systems and Network Corporation. And in your um, <clears throat> testimony, you indicated that, uh, that the expertise that representative payee reviewers should have uh, should be statutorily authorized governmental entities. For the committee's sake, what did you mean by that? There, there are entities that um, the federal government has authorized uh, in various ways to do other things that um, can be brought in here, and, and one in particular uh, is obviously the protection and advocacy systems. So they would have a better understanding of the kind of clientele that they're dealing with. They just don't have a green shade. And what's alarming to us, of course, is when we're looking at where SSA is in terms of performance and scheduled to do 1,300 by this company uh, by August and only having done 11 uh, is not a very uh, a good track record. You also mentioned uh, something in your uh, testimony, uh, scenarios you described regarding payees who are also creditors, which is very concerning. 
especially in cases where there is a family or friend who is willing to serve as the payee. What recommendations do you have for SSA, and what did you mean by more wild card monitoring? Uh, I think that um, on the creditors, we, we would like to, um, we're planning, the task force is planning to submit some additional recommendations to the committees, and I'd like to um, develop that further in terms of the creditors, um, because that is a big issue for um, both aging and for people who are younger in terms of uh, residents in a nursing home or any other sort of facility, group home or something like that. They're, those are very serious issues. Sure. Um, in terms of the wild cards, that is something that um, uh, was developed with uh, in 2015 between the protection and advocacy agencies and the Social Security Administration. Um, together, um, the uh, SSA authorized that the PNA agen agencies would be allowed to identify additional payees to review that were not included in the SSA-generated list of payees. And um, this allowed the PNAs to take advantage of their years of working with um, the, these populations and their experience in uncovering abuse and neglect and the knowledge of the payees in their states and the, the fact that some of the organizations that knew that they were doing this work were saying, how come you haven't reviewed this, um, this payee or this organization? Um, and so these were called the wild cards. They didn't come up through the SSA's algorithm. And the wild cards actually found a higher percentage of problems than the SSA algorithm did. And the problems found in the wild cards were also likely to be more severe in nature and to contain possible misman more likely to contain possible mismanagement of beneficiary funds and to contain other problems. They contained higher instances of possible fraud, health or safety and residence problems, and possible uh, Fair Labor Standards Act violations. Mr. Chairman, if we could allow her just for the record, if you have anything further on why. Are we going to have another round? Uh, we haven't talked about it, I guess. Okay. Uh, I've, we've got some uh, data on that, the percentages that we could enter into the record, if you would like. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you all for being here. Just to get a little bit of size and scope of what it is that we're trying to address, and I'm with Mr. Larson, because this takes a lot more time. And I think when we talk about these things, sometimes it's hard to realize the universe. Mr. Slayton, you made a comment, and you call it the, the, about this, this new group of people that were coming in every day. You called them what, the silver? Silver tsunami is how we were referring to them. Silver to tsunami. Degree. See, well, Mr. Larson is part of the tsunami. I'm partially there, but not there the whole way. Um, <laughs> but the size and scope of this population, this is the thing that really worries me, because it does come down to dollars that are allocated to handle this. When we talk about beneficiaries, just if any of you could talk about, when it comes to Social Security beneficiaries, in the total universe, how many are there that receive a payment? 60 million. 60 million. Of the 60 million, the number is how many that are, that there's, a, there, there's a, uh, an individual or an organizational payee that takes care of that for them? That's how many in that universe? Approximately 8 million. 8 million. And so that it comes down to on some of the individuals. Now, Chairman Johnson talked about that Weston case in Philadelphia, which is absolutely horrible, where people actually died. They were chained to uh, the furnaces in the basement of the house. Uh, people died, and then they had the, some of the other folks stage it like they died in bed, and they moved them to, to different areas. But when it comes to safety net, now the Weston case, I think there's maybe a dozen payees, right? But when it comes to safety net in Oregon, there's a thousand payees. So the organizational payee, how in the world would you address that situation? I think this is really critical for people back home that are listening to us, especially for those who fund Social Security, and those are members of, of, of the workforce. Uh, that money that is allocated to Social Security, can you give me an idea how big that budget is? Because I think Mr. Larson's on something. Do we have enough dollars to actually do the things we need to do? It's okay. I mean, if, if we don't, just say we don't. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you just repeat the question? Well, my, my question is because of the, the numbers you just gave me, to me, are staggering. Right. And then we're asking Social Security, well, you need to do this, 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 and that. You need to make sure that everybody who's a payee is, is legit. And you need to make sure that you're following up with this. And I say to you, okay, well, in order to do that, in addition to the beneficiaries receiving a payment, we also have to run SSA. So how are we funding that? At what dollar amount are we right now? 
the, to run uh, the budget. If you can just tell me roughly what the budget is, because uh, the numbers are always staggering for me. $12.4 billion administrative budget. $12.4 billion with a B. Yes. Okay. And how many, how many people are in the agency uh, working? Any, any idea on that? I'm going to approximate that it's about 60,000, including our state disability determination office. Okay. So 12.4 billion, 60,000 work in the agency, but we're still not really able to fully uh, handle responsibly what we're doing with our beneficiaries. I'm, I'm, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I'm just trying to figure out if this is the model, how are we going to fund it and our expectations exceed what we actually have the dollars to do? With respect to the representative payee program, I think you stated it properly that the scope of that program and monitoring essentially the behavior of six million people is a daunting challenge for the agency, yes. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's any more, anything more dangerous. I love being online, but I've already seen what's going on online. I don't know how you check people to find out if these are really the people that we think they are and if they are really doing the right thing for the people that they're supposed to be taking care of. Um, are you able to look into the private sector and see how they're able to meet the needs of whatever it is that they do, uh, credit card companies, people, people uh, that actually are keeping track of this? Because I'm looking at the size and scope of what we're talking about, and I'm really wondering, as you are, how in the world are we going to be able to build a model that actually is effective and efficient? And I, that, I, listen, I'm disturbed about what, what happens with some of our, our, our payees and the fact that they're not in a position uh, and they're deemed not to be in a position where they can actually make the right decisions for themselves. I didn't even think about people who can't communicate before. That thing about people flinching when somebody comes near them, I can picture that in my mind. I can't imagine how horrible it must be for some of those folks. But this is a huge, huge problem. So I think when we talk about budgets, we need to understand that there's dollars allocated, and then the question would be, uh, especially for people from the, pr from the private sector, how are they prioritized, and are we looking at it in the right way, and are we missing somehow what we could do uh, to make it more beneficial for the people that are the beneficiaries? Because I, I'm really worried about the way this is heading, and with this silver tsunami uh, that we're facing, uh, it's, 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 it's bigger every single day. So it's, it's incredibly important for us to have a deeper dive into this. But, but thank you all for being here. I applaud you for what you do, especially on behalf of those who can't uh, take care of themselves. I mean, those are the most vulnerable. Those are the people we always want to take care of. So we need to have a better scope about what we can do to help you help them. <clears throat> I right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. This is great, great hearing. Mr. Larson, thank you. I'm on board I, with you. I do want to add one thing, because you like numbers. Uh, I had the, the head of the administration in Sarasota last year. We were talking about the cost, the administration cost. They put out a trillion dollars. That's the number. I think it's 993 billion. A trillion, a thousand billions is what they they have to put out in the community. So just think about that in the demographics. Yeah. I just wanted to add to your point here about this. You know, the scope of this agency. It's one thing to look at the expense. You got to look at what what are they actually processing, and they've got to work with. Yeah, so I just want to just just to follow up with you because you and I do understand this. 6.2% from the person who receives uh, a pay, 6.2% match from the person who pays, and that's 12.4%. But those people have to be in the workforce. Yeah. And so we increase our workforce numbers, it's hard to find out where the revenue is going to come from. And I really worry about that. I know uh, because of Chairman Johnson, he has been tireless on making sure that we're getting the right dollars to the right people at the right time and getting it from the right source. And we have to find a way to grow that workforce, and we have to find a way to use those dollars in the best way to take care of the most vulnerable. So I really appreciate what you're doing. I think this is a fantastic hearing. I really do wish we had a, a lot longer to spend with you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Gabello. You're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you and uh, Chairman Johnson for this opportunity. We're exploring two uh, critical issues today. Uh, how we take care of the most vulnerable Americans, seniors who need help managing their Social Security benefits. And I think the other major theme here today is government competence. And we've seen uh, over the years an erosion of trust and confidence in our government institutions. And some of the examples uh, that have been mentioned today, I think, exacerbate uh, that uh, current reality. Uh, I want to ask uh, the Acting Inspector General, Ms. Stone, a June 2015 study found cases where the SSA made benefit payments to representative pays who were deceased. Can you expound on that a little bit and explain uh, how this happens and what some of the solutions might be? Uh, if I could sum this up, I would say that it's 
it's a matter of uh, the systems within SSA not talking to each other. Um, when you do not have complete information within the rep payee system on payee data, and you cannot compare that to other information in SSA, such as a death master file, when there's inconsistency there, there's a likelihood that you will continue to pay a payee who is deceased. And that is, in fact, what happened in this situation. Ms. Lacanfra, what is being done to mitigate, to address this situation? So thank you to the Inspector General for uh, helping us to identify the problem. And we have begun the complete redesign of our death reporting system so that they do talk to each other. We've already had a couple of different releases of that software so that, in fact, it makes it impossible for us to record multiple differing dates of death across our systems. There'll only be one date of death. It'll be the one that we always reference, and it will override everything else. So in effect, we, we have corrected the problem, and we will continue to strengthen our system's infrastructure to close other gaps that have been identified by the IG. Ms. Stone, can you confirm that? Do you think the SSA is taking positive steps that could address this effectively? I cannot uh, specifically confirm whether or not the changes they've made are actually working as intended because we have not done any follow-up work in that area. But I will say they are definitely heading in the right direction with respect to uh, really trying to get their hands around the rep payee issue. The fact that they are doing some of the predictive modeling and the fact that they have the uh, electronic representative payee system are some, some of the, um, I guess, building blocks that will be necessary for the agency to be able to address this problem going into the future. Well, I thank you all for your work on this issue and for collaborating with the committee. I think our shared goal here is that the American people have greater trust and confidence in the Social Security Administration and more broadly uh, in their government. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Meehan. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank this panel for the work that you're doing in this very, very important area as a former prosecutor, I spent time frequently dealing with the sorry circumstances where people who were charged with caring for elderly uh, neglected that responsibility. I also saw so many circumstances where uh, people really took on the responsibility and managed the affairs of elderly uh, and, and did it in a, in a very admirable fashion. So I know we're working towards a time in which as we grow older, we're going to see more reliance on these relationships. And there's already been one uh, aspect that has been uh, pointed out, which I think you've commented on, but if anybody has any further words about how we might be able to uh, fix it, it is that we've created a point in time in which checks only go back uh, or representative payees, you know, uh, people have been grandfathered in. Uh, I had a circumstance in which in my own Philadelphia region, uh, we had a woman by the name of uh, Linda Weston who served as a representative payee for four separate individuals. Only later did they discover the horrid circumstances, including abuse and, and, and other things that were part of that. So what are we doing to check to assure that any kind of information related to a background of somebody who's already been grandfathered into the payee situation is kept current so we don't find a circumstance where somebody is abusing an individual. Does anybody have a, a response to that? Uh, I can start. I think our strongest tool is our misuse predictive model. We have a predictive model that uses a lot of data and various characteristics. And in the Weston case, that was an individual serving, as you said, multiple individual beneficiaries. And, and we look at characteristics like that in the misuse predictive model, people who are serving multiple beneficiaries and a whole host of other factors to target individuals and organizations to do on-site reviews. When the, when the, a big part of this is the privacy issue as well. To what extent when there's oversight, is it, is it done just to, how do you audit to the extent that there is or review the financial circumstances of somebody who is a, uh, you know, who's, who's having their affairs managed by a payee? Uh, 
uh, both with respect to what that person might be doing, but the thing that I saw so frequently would be where seniors would become victimized by things like telemarketers and others. And it wasn't necessarily that it was the payee who was taking advantage, but their negligence, so to speak. They would just sort of not watch the accounts. And we saw savings that would just be drained because seniors wouldn't appreciate, payments were made into their accounts, and they were drained by periodic dunning, which would be done because somebody, a telemarketer, got purportedly a senior. Is there a way that there's a check to see that accounts and other kinds of things, uh, which would be oftentimes a social security check, is one of the things that goes into the assets that a senior has? Anybody with respect to, uh, my, my concern is that the, we don't have a, uh, Federal Privacy Act is a detriment because the Social Security Administration finds that a, re a representative payee has committed fraud and also as conservative, sir, the agency's barred from providing that information to the courts. Do we find that? Um, that is true that right now the, the biggest complaint is that the state court orders are not recognized by Social Security, so it does uh, mean that if a court finds a conservator, uh, removes a conservator for cause, that person can still stay on as the representative. That's stunning. Why, is that our fault? It is part of the um, Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, section. Why? Why is that put in there? What does it serve and should it be changed? Um, I, there's two, I think, two different issues. One is whether we recognize the conservator as the representative payee, and the other is whether we can disclose information back to the courts. Two different issues. On the first one, we do consider whether there is a legal guardian or a conservator, and we have a list, like a preference list, by which we choose who should be the payee. So it's not that we're completely dismissing the fact that there's a conservator, but we do reserve the right to explore all potentially you know, viable candidates candidates for the job, because you could have someone, for example, who lives in another state, while the better payee may be the custodial parent. So we, we do make, we reserve the right to make a judgment but call. Could you speak to the second most important one, which is we have a court here. We have somebody who's, who's in authority to overlook this. Why would there be a failure to so to the second issue about disclosing information, we're simply prohibited by the Privacy Act from disclosing information to How state courts. could that courts. be fixed? That would be require legislative change. I understand that. <laughs> what would be the right fix? Could you, at some point in time, report back to us if anybody has ideas on how you would suggest it be fixed? Thank yes, you. we will. Mr. Chairman, you're back. Thank you. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. One, one of the things, I did have the administrator down to Sarasota in Florida, uh, probably 30 percent of my district's uh, 65 and older in terms of the demographics. So I see what's taking place uh, in Florida, but I'm sure throughout the country people are living longer. My mother-in-law's in town. She's 97. She had a sister 101 and others, another sister 103. So you see, you know, maybe you see more of it in Florida. But I, I do want to say with these on-site inspections or reviews, whatever you're calling them, uh, you, you've gone from 2,500 to 5,000. Uh, is that enough, or does that make sense? How did you come up with that number? Historically, we've done about 2,000 reviews. Last year, I think we did 2,400. We, we do the ones that are required by statute, and there's approximately 1,600 of those, and the rest of them we've added on simply because we believe it's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, we are constrained in terms of how many we can do, so our 5,000 goal, which we haven't achieved yet, that's a multi-year phase-in process, is just simply on our part an ambitious target to double the number of reviews. And I, I touched on this earlier, but I was kind of blown away. I didn't, I didn't look at the number. I thought it was, but I said collectively, she mentioned a trillion dollars, 993 billion. So it gives you some scope of it. In general, I think you guys have done a heck of a job, but there's always ways to improve it and get better. I want to flip to the abuse side, Ms. Stone. What do you, uh, how much, I would think mostly family would do a lot of this, but what is the percentage 
a family that becomes uh, the payee compared to third-party facilitators. Uh, do you have do you, you know that number offhand, Ms. Stone, or either of the ladies? Do you know that? I would say Ms. Lock and Four may be better positioned to answer that question. About half of all individuals with a payee are minor children, and in most of those cases, you have a custodial parent who would be the preferred payee. I'm thinking of seniors. What, do you have a sense in terms of seniors what percentage it is? That are, uh, that are served by are a Are their friend? children uh, actually managing it compared to... Well, well, let me just move on a little bit. Um, we, I mentioned earlier, Ms. Stone, uh, that in terms of Hillsborough County, which is Tampa, part of my district, there was, it went on for 10 years, $600,000 they got from the Social Security Administ Administration. A third party, the television down there, had discovered that. How widespread do you think that not some kind of abuse or that kind of abuse goes on? Do you have any sense of that? I, I do not. Um, it's scary to me to think that something could go on for six years, at 60000 a year, I, average, I guess, for 10 years, and, and nobody has any uh, sense of that, that that's going on. And uh, I, the fact that you're asking this question speaks to, I guess, our fundamental um, concern in this area as well. The population, when again, you compare it to the total number of people that SSA serves, may be small. But when you do have um, a breakdown in uh, a rep payee providing the service to the beneficiaries, it can be uh, very daunting it, and it can impact those people that we consider to be our most vulnerable citizens. Okay. Let me get back to the point, you know, a lot of people at some point in their life end up with dementia or Alzheimer's, and uh, who's taking care of, who's overseeing uh, their financial affairs? That's what I'm trying to say, how much of it is their, their children, or uh, how much of it is outside facilitators that are overseeing that? Okay, so I'll answer that question you had asked before. 85% uh, of representative payees are family members, primarily parents. Um, okay. and, and I did mention, it's worth mentioning since you said dementia, that we are doing research in that area to examine the outcomes of individuals with and without payees who have dementia to see what value the representative payee program is adding for those individuals versus those who are more informally served by friends or family members without a formal payee. And I, I just think in terms of the agency looking going forward, They've got to be thinking about that, you know, people are living longer, uh, the demographics in the country where you've got more seniors, uh, they say 10, 12,000 a day uh, turn 65 for the next 30 years, every day for the next 30 years. So we really have to be not thinking about the past 30, but in terms of going forward the next 30, I think that some of the gentlemen raised that question, are we doing enough to make sure people are being served properly? With that, anybody that like the second question, I'm going to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Larson from Connecticut. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this has been very um, insightful. And I <clears throat> want to follow up with what um, both Mr. Kelly and Mr. Meehan were saying in, in their remarks. I couldn't help but observe, Ms. Euchert, during uh, this discussion that a number of times you were wringing your hands like you wanted to respond. And here's my question, and, and, it's, uh, and it would involve uh, both um, uh, the task force, Ms. Ford, uh, the SSA, Ms. Langafora, and Ms. Euchert, it seemed obviously there's this huge gap between what the courts see as a, a, as a problem and how, under current law, SSA can res respond, as Mr. Meehan was pointing out, based on a number of the privacy concerns. And as you aptly pointed out, now there's two separate issues that you're, you're dealing with here. A, has the task force looked into this? And is, a way, is there a way for us to bridge this gap so that as Mr. Mean, I think, was driving for, how can we change the law to effect, effectively make sure that the court function and the privacy functions are blended in a way that works and I would hope allows us to lower the caseload, work and coordinate, if the three of you could try to respond to that, and we'll start with you, Ms. Ford, and then Ms. Euchert, because of your 
very patience in this, and then uh, Ms. Lankafor, who we've been. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think we uh, definitely have to look at changing the law if that is keeping um, uh, SSA from reporting something that serious. I has, don't. Uh, has the task force recommended anything? We don't have that recommendation right yet, but we can certainly get that to you. And, that would be great if you could. And we talked a little bit earlier about getting together and and looking at some of these issues and and talking through some of the recommendations and seeing where there might be some uh, joint work that could be done together. So I think that that's something that could come out of this hearing too. Ms. Euchre, could you join with them in that? Or is there? Uh, we would be happy to. Um, we also staff the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators. Uh, they've been concerned with this issue for quite some time and I know that they would be happy to draft a resolution and um, um, uh, join in any collaborative. And I think very pragmatically what Mr. Meehan was driving for is there, is that could you give us the language that will allow us to do that? And so then it would fall obviously back to uh, uh, the administration and would you be receptive to that? You've indicated in your testimony that it would need legislative change. Yes, we'd be happy to provide technical assistance to the committee and work with you and your staffs. Is do you have specific things that you would recommend to us? Because it uh, seems like this is a huge gap here uh, that becomes intuitively obvious as we discuss this. You're bound by what the law is and how to follow it. You're being very courteous and polite. You, sometimes you have to say to the, to the members up here, look, this is what you need to do. <laughs> and it's gotta be that blunt and that simple. Uh, that's how Mr. Johnson would handle it, right? And uh, so that would be very important to us. And we've heard great testimony from people that are working very hard to preserve a system. We understand that, and Mr. Buchanan points out, we, in looking at the system, we know that people are performing to the best of their ability. We know that you're operating under a resource crunch, but we also know even if the, the numbers are small in terms of who's abusing the system, 1% of that large a number is a lot of money and we have got to do everything to make sure that we protect the integrity of the program. We all care about privacy issues, but there's got to be a way for us to draft this that would be sufficient with the courts, with the agencies, and with the task force that will make Ms. Stone's job easier too when you're doing the audits. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield, yield back and look forward to getting your feedback. It would be vitally important to the committee and perhaps we could work collaboratively, as um, I know both chairmen are inclined to do, to come up with model legislation that could help in this area. Thank you. I now recognize our newest member from Michigan, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, conducting this hearing. Uh, thank you to the panel as well for your time and uh, consideration of the issue. I uh, would like to follow up, if I could, with Ms. Stone's testimony um, and, and ask you if are all reports of misconduct or abuse, um, are they all investigated? And if so, what's the timeline in which you conduct this investigation and close the file? Well, the, the timeline is flexible or it varies based on the complexity of the case. I'll start there. Uh, in 2016, we had approximately 16,500 allegations that were somehow related to uh, a representative payee issue. Of that, we opened uh, roughly 450 cases, and we had approximately uh, 108, yes, I think about 108 convictions related to that, 180 convictions related to that. And the way that our process works with the allegations is we worked hand in hand with the agency and that when some allegations come in, we forward it to SSA for there to be a determination of misuse. At the end of the day, when we're actually getting convictions, a large percentage of that is as a result of the referrals and the work that SSA is providing to us. So is there a backlog in the number of, of cases or investigations? Do you get to all of the cases? There, there is not a backlog. At some, all of them are, are at, I would say, varying stages. Because I started out with the, the large number at the 
very beginning. Uh, when we send those over to the agency, it may be determined at that point that no further action is needed. But some type of resolution takes place for every allegation that we get. Now, I, I do have to admit that some of them are closed out because we do not, or the case itself may not meet certain prosecutorial guidelines, i.e. I. a number of cases that were referred to us last year uh, related to amounts less than $12,000. So it's difficult for us to get a criminal prosecution in some jurisdictions for amounts that are that small. And I, a follow-up question, too, with uh, a question that was asked earlier. Um, of, uh, I think it was from, um, from uh, Representative Wolarski. There would be, in my mind, a a benefit to have a family member as the representative payee, uh, given the fact they know the circumstances the best and the, uh, the beneficiary the best. Are you more or less likely to see abuse when the representative payee is a family member? Mm. Great question. Based and, and actually, if anybody would like, like to answer that question. Based on the study that um, the National Academy did back in 2007, I believe, uh, a, being a family member was not one of the factors that would lead one to believe that an individual is more likely to misuse the benefits. In fact, to the contrary, if, it, if you're looking at the um, profile model, you would look for situations where the rep payee did not have a familiar relationship with the payee. Maybe the person did not have substantial income or was self-employed, did not have earnings for a substantial period of time. It's those kinds of factors that would uh, lead you to believe that maybe this person needs a little more oversight than someone else. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and, and I want to thank Chairman Johnson and you, Chairman Buchanan, for doing this. I think that uh, this is like a Pandora's box. We've opened this thing now. We've got to find out where it's going. I, I, I got to tell you that you being here is so valuable to us because uh, in this life that we're in right now, if you come to see us in our office, you get like 15 minutes, and then somebody knocks on the door and says, you know, the ag people are here, and you have 15 minutes with them, and somebody knocks on the door and says, the manufacturing people are here. And so uh, there's this great belief that we really understand every situation because you had 15 minutes uh, to, to share it with us. Uh, I think in the Senate, you probably don't even get to see senators. Uh, at least in the House, you get to actually see reps. Uh, but I am really concerned with this. And I, and I think a, a, as we open this up, uh, because I do know where the revenue comes from. And I keep going back to that workforce participation, the fact that all of these uh, wonderful programs are funded by hardworking American taxpayers. These are all wage taxes. And so w where do wage taxes come from? People that are working. And, and I, I keep worrying about... Are there some best practices? We could look at the private sector to how they handle fraud, how they handle abuse. Are there some things that we can use from the private sector and mesh in with what we're doing in the government? I'm always astounded that, it, that, a, that an entity that has great numbers of dollars that it spends is so far behind what the rest of the world is doing. Uh, and I think that, and please don't take this the wrong way, when it's your own money, you really start to worry about it because you're the one that's got to replace it, and then you realize, wait a minute, that is my money. Uh, so I want to make sure that we're taking care of everybody the way we can. But the, the other side of it is, it's only you that can get that information to us. So I'm going to ask you something. Please, don't give up or get frustrated and think there's nobody listening. And it really doesn't matter how we're registered or how we vote. We're all trying to do what's in the best interest of the people we represent. So having said all that, is there anything in the private sector you look at, you know, if we could if we could bring this into government, boy, would we be a lot more effective. Boy, would be a lot more efficient. Just any of you. Yes, Mrs. Eukert, please. Thank you so much. I mean, this, this, there is a program that, that we have been working with with Minnesota. I know that Social Security uses uh, sort of their risk factors based on the characteristics of the person. Um, we've been working with Minnesota. They've got the only um, software system for conservators. It requires transaction-based um, data to be submitted. 
And with them, we've been working on a, a predictive model based on those transactions. And we've succeeded in, in using 10 risk indicators that already predict 80% of the what they call the level four cases. Um, the entire system needs to be modernized, and we believe that there, are, there is the software, there is the technology. Um, as long as you've got some auditing resources and you've got some statisticians who can develop some predictive analytics, that we're moving toward a system where we can take the resources and know in advance to push them towards those particular cases. But it does require that individual transactions be submitted through software, and I know Mr. Slayton is also working on that same uh, approach in Texas. Mr. Slayton, could you share what, what Texas is doing? We're, we're uh, basically doing the same thing that Ms. Secret was talking about with regard to uh, Minnesota. We are looking at, we are, we are within months of, of rolling out uh, similar predictive uh, analytics, uh, and we, what we'll be doing is requiring transaction-based reporting. Um, so rather than, there, right now, many times when, when folks file their annual accountings, they just put beginning balance, ending balance, and I spent expenses and revenue, and there's, uh, there's a requirement in law that it be very detailed and transaction-based, but right now many of those are filed in paper, and so the ability to truly review the volume is very difficult. So the system that we're implementing would require the guardians to file their um, information through the system. It would use this predictive model, looking at the transactions to say, we know by the research that's been done that this type of transaction points to fraud. And that gives us an ability to target our resources towards those individuals where we think there are problems. Um, and then you know, use the remaining resources, resources we had to review the rest of the cases, but specifically focusing on those where we can uh, because the predictive analytics see that there are potential issues. How often do you all get a chance to exchange best practices? When, when can you, you can go out of where you are and to talk to somebody else? I know there's a lot of smart people out there, but sometimes smart people don't get to talk to other smart people. So wh when do you, do you have that opportunity to actually have that, that exchange of ideas? We do that regularly um, through the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court M Administrators, which meet at least uh, twice. Uh, they've got a joint meeting in August, I believe, and, and separate meetings in the, in the year. Um, I staff the Elders and Courts, the CCJ Costco Elders and Courts Committee. Uh, so there's a, a frequent exchange of information on best practices. Thank you all for being here. It's critical. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lincoln, for uh, how does someone report a problem with a pay to Social Security? And when a problem is found, what happens next? Can you describe the process for remedying deficiencies? Sure. Anyone can report a problem to Social Security related to allegations of misuse, and we will undertake an investigation in all of those cases and question both the beneficiary and the payee in certain cases. Does that case happen pretty quick? Yes. And in some cases, uh, we will make a referral to the Inspector General. As Ms. Stone said, the vast majority of the cases that they opened were SSA referrals. So we also do that. Um, and we'll try to act swiftly to change the payee when necessary. So how does SSA decide whether to remove a payee or pursue another course of action, such as working with the payee to correct the problem? We're looking to see whether the payee has the best interests of the beneficiary um, at heart. That's the primary criteria. And so if someone is making allegations that the money is not being spent on them, on the beneficiary, for their daily needs, such as food, shelter, and clothing, that's what we're looking to figure out. And if we can substantiate those allegations, or if even we feel like the payee is not being forthcoming or that there's um, suspicion there that we can't resolve, we can take action to change the payee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be part of the formal hearing record. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah. Thanks, hey, thank you. Thanks, Sam.